Thank you for joining us on this journey to discover more about the English Riviera UNESCO Global Geopark, one of Earth's extraordinary places. In this series of interviews, our patron, Professor Ian Stewart, explores what it is that makes this geopark so special, from when the rocks around us were formed, to evidence of early humans, and right up to artists and writers who are being inspired by the geopark today. Welcome to the Geopark in Focus, which is an informal, conversational showcase, a celebration of geology and culture here in the Southwest that focuses on the English Riviera UNESCO Global Geopark. And geoparks are these places of, of important global, indeed, geological significance, but ones that infiltrate and infuse into the popular culture, into the industrial culture, the, the, the natural heritage of a particular region, and that region is the Torbay area. And, and that importance of geology, the rocks underfoot and what they mean for the present day is a critical part of the geopark and it's a critical part of the discussion today. And the bit that we'll be focusing on is the rocks. Now, normally what we talk about in history is we start in the, the modern and we go back in time. But geologists are a kind of unruly bunch, really. And, and we're going to do it the opposite way. We're going to start with the old. We're going to start with the oldest part of the rocks in the region. And we're going to carry forth into much younger times. And to take us through on that journey, we've got two experts. We've got Dr. Kevin Page, who's an expert on the, the rocks of the, of the Southwest, particularly the Ammonites. But we hear a lot more about, about the various uh, strata that's in this region. And then Professor Mike Benton at the University of Bristol, who's an expert on the, uh, the ancient life in particular of, of this region. And they're going to be our, our kind of journeymen. They're going to be our guides through the geology of the English Riviera. So welcome both. Um, I thought I'd start with um, this business. We're Anyone who knows uh, Devon um, knows that probably the, the rocks in this area are the Devonian rocks now named after, I'm presuming, uh, Cornwall. I mean, obviously, Devon. Um, so one of the intricacies is where does this, the, the name Devonian come from in terms of, you know, how, how did someone decide that the rocks of this particular age group across the world, everywhere across the world, um, is Devonian? Uh, Mike, do you want to uh, kind of take us through the start of that? Yeah, there, there, was a, there was a big debate about this back in the 1830s. And this was, a, this is ages ago, but this is when geology was becoming uh, a professional subject and people were wondering about the history of the rocks and um, were they arranged in a kind of chaotic way, just a heap of this here and a heap of that there, or could they be put into sequence? And indeed, people had seen all these rocks in Devon, um, but in other parts of the UK, they were collecting from uh, uh, collecting fossil fish and stuff like that in the north of Scotland uh, and down the Welsh borders. And, and the fight and the debate was, could they correlate these um, red sandstones from further north, which were full of fossil fish, and of course that attracted a huge amount of attention. Could they match those in age with um, the, the limestones and other kinds of marine rocks uh, uh, in Devon, including around the, the geopark? Um, and people got very heated about that. When you read these papers, they kind of say stuff we wouldn't um, dream of saying today, oh, you know, really on parliamentary language. And, and uh, it involved all the big names of the day, Murchison and, and, and Sedgwick and Dillabesh and all these big geology uh, professors and leaders in the field. In the end, it was sorted out that they were the same age. And what they were looking at was rocks that were deposited um, in rivers and, and in a kind of terrestrial setting, which and lakes, which uh, contained the fish, but they were kind of red sandstones and, and stuff. Uh, and they're the same age, although the, the, the marine rocks around Torquay don't contain these fishes. They're completely different, deposited in a shallow sea full of corals and, and other coral reef living creatures. So, you know, when you looked at them straight off, you'd have no idea that they would match in age. Um, but it was finally resolved and understood. Yeah, because I mean, for me, I think most of the country, Devonian, ironically, means red rocks to me. I've said Scotland and things like that. And so the Devonian rocks of, of the southern, southernmost kind of tip are very different from the Devonian rocks elsewhere in the UK. 
That's right, and, and they, they had different names, so they were calling the marine stuff in, in about 1830, was referred to as Devonian or Devon or whatever, yeah. limestones, and the, the fish-bearing rocks were called Old Red Sandstone, because yeah. guess what? It's old and it's red and it's sandstone. And <laughs> See, geology is so difficult, isn't it? It's so technically yeah, that's right. complex. It. Old <laughs> Red Sandstone. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we're kind of using common words because, of course, geology grew out of a very practical uh, area of which is connected to farming on the one hand, quarrying mm -hmm. on the other hand, and why would you invent, you know, stupid scientific names? And so, although they're not seen in this part of Devon, the fishers were, they really drew a lot of attention because that tied the, the history of the rocks to the question of age. I mean, there was mm -hmm. no way at that time, of course, of putting an age in millions of years, but people looked at these weird fish and they looked nothing like fish today. They looked like well, they were heavily armored. They looked more like a shoebox or something like that. You know, they were kind of covered in bony plates, the whole thing, and, and there was very little moving, just a kind of wiggly tail or something. And so these were not in any way sleek, swimming things like modern fish at all. And they would just be grubbing around on the seabed, kind of lumpy, heavy armored things feeding in, in the mud. Um, and, and so that got people excited, though, because they looked at them and thought, my goodness, these are extremely ancient. We don't know how mm. ancient, but they're clearly something from a huge amount of time ago. And when people discussed age, they were kind of thinking thousands of years, like in the Bible, yeah. or unknown amounts of time. And, and nobody could even put a finger on that. Yeah. And so ironically, of course, it, having settled out this, this uh, the idea of the Devonian, that, that notion that actually the Devonian in, in the Torbay area and English Riviera Geopark are, are very distinct then from these other uh, kind of species. I mean, Kevin, t tell us about those, the marine kind of fossils that we find down in, in the Torbay area. Well, it's one thing which, which the sort of proposers of the Devonian as a time period actually realized there was something intermediate between the fossils in Devon and also mm. Cornwall and, and, and those they saw in the Carboniferous limestones uh, in the Midlands and South Wales and the old Silurian rocks below. So they realized they're intermediate. So they're mm. sort of very much a transition phase in Earth history. So you have a lot of primitive uh, corals and shells, brachiopod shells, which are much more primitive than modern clams. You have trilobites or woodlouse like things uh, crawling around. And you have the wonderful ammonites, which, which were a sort of coiled uh, squid-like animal with a coiled shell, which they could actually use to float up and down in the water. Uh, and so the whole world was, was quite, quite different from it is now. Uh, and as you say, they had these strange fish. Strange enough, not many of them were actually in the sea. Most of them were in, in rivers and lakes, but occasionally these things would swim by. And some of them were quite large, so like sort of... 10 meters long and things like ten, this. I remember, all right, 10 meter long yeah, fish. The, the biggest ones. And my mic can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, That's there were pretty big. big I mean, one, one of the terror, uh, terror animals of the TV series is Dunkleosteus, which is one of these giant fish things. Uh, and, and if you Google that, you'll find this incredible great monster thing. And we do actually have pieces of its relatives in Devon and Cornwall. So we have elements of the fish, but we also have this incredible environment which you can actually best experience in the region in, in the UNESCO Global Geopark. About 380 million years ago uh, we were in a tropical zone, mm -hmm. uh, something just just south of the equator, warm shallow tropical seas and there were... So reefs. The, the proper Riviera, is that what you're getting at? The proper the... Riviera. Yes, nice and warm. No, actually, even we even warmer than the actual Riviera because we're talking tropical. Because the Riviera is just it's just Mediterranean. It's yeah, no more. Yeah. Okay. Good but point. we're talking of Indonesian style reefs with a whole different set of of animals living in them. So just paint us a picture. If we had gone snorkeling three hundred eighty million years ago on the the limestones of uh, of Torbay, what would we have seen? What would life on that that sea been like? Well, it would be, be a bit like sort of uh, snorking on the fringes of the Great Barrier Reef uh, in Australia with sort of great domes of corals and a, a type of sponge called a stroma toporoid. Uh, these things growing in masses, they're probably quite brightly coloured like corals today, 
and with uh, very stick shaped organisms sticking up and uh, uh, crinoids for instance will, which are like a starfish on, on a flexible stick waving around in the currents and occasionally a little trilobite would uh, scuttle by a woodlouse like thing sort of a foraging mm. for food and maybe the old nautiloid or ammonoid basically a squid with a shell might swim by so uh, something sort of somehow familiar but looking mm -hmm. in detail everything is different it's not quite the same it's like in a parallel universe similar sorts of things doing similar sorts of ways of life as modern reefs but all different so, so in terms of specifically around the Riviera coast where, where would you see these kind of areas I mean and the one I know best uh, and have been known for some time is Hope's Nose which is a I think a kind of classic, classic site. So maybe tell us a little bit Hope's Nose, but there's a, there are other places to see these. these uh, there, there are, and there's a lot easier places to get to than that she Hope's Nose, which is quite, quite a walk down. But down there you have surfaces uh, which you can walk across, and these are these domes of corals and these coralline sponges. So you can actually imagine you're on a seafloor, and especially if you've got a nice blue sky, not like today behind you, you can actually get that tropical feeling down there and, that, and that's what's so remarkable about Hope's Nose that it is like going back into the past and swimming through a reef. You can also go to Triangle Point at Meadfoot Beach where the rocks have been tipped on a big slope and you can actually see some of these fossils in the rock there. But if you look at either of sorry. Well, I was just thinking in terms of people collecting, because there are really quite strict rules on what's allowed to be collected or not. So we should make that clear. Do you want to say a little bit? Yeah, people can't just turn up and smack off a bit of rock and, and take it home. Well, no, I mean, Tor Bay is a very, very special area. Uh, and the rocks are absolutely amazing. And they, they've taken, so in some cases, probably centuries for the weathering to etch out the fossils. So <laughs> if someone tried to collect them, they'd just destroy this forever on a human, human time scale. So the area is, is necessarily protected by sort of different sorts of legislation uh, and things to stop, uh, unfortunately, a, a problematic fringe from going along and attacking this and removing things for just for their own sort of selfish gain. But the great, the, the thing is really to see it experience in situ, that, that, I mean, in place. And that's yeah. where you get the feeling of the scale of things. A small piece of rock sitting on a shelf really doesn't give you that image. And also you've, whoever's taken that rock has taken away something which someone else could have in, in, yeah. enjoyed. So it's a very selfish thing. It's, it's, a, it's illegal, but it's also quite selfish to go and take some of these amazing... So take a magnifying glass. I, I remember, oh, that's the place I remember seeing, just looking around and you just start to, your eye starts to really see all the intricacies of the detail because it's stacked. And if you've got a good, a good camera on your phone, then you can zoom in and take close-ups. Yeah and things and, and then go back and, and sort of the comfort of your own living room you can actually enjoy sort of all the detail of of the fossils so, so there's, there's you, you can collect but you can collect images so if it was a, a rare occurrence of a rainy day here in the english yeah. riviera where could we see some of these rocks and fossils kevin torquay museum of course it's it's got some of the most important natural history museums uh, so sort of collections in in the country and a, a lot of very famous Devonian fossils and fossils of other ages. So yeah, definitely head for the museum. So uh, Mike, I just wanted to more generally in the Devonian, any other interesting things about the Devonian world? Of, you know, the, you know the UK or further afield. Yeah, I mean the Devonian was a very important time in the history of life. So there were not only all of these wonderful reefs that Kevin has described and, and various early kinds of fishes. Uh, it marks actually a very big transition in the history of the earth because we have to think about the, the relationship of life and, and the planet. Um, and we often think only of how plants and animals occupy the earth. We sometimes forget that they can modify the earth in a massive kind of way. Um, and there's two examples happening in the Devonian pretty much for the first time. In the sea, we get these big reefs and there had been different kinds of reef systems in older oceans but but of course a reef is, is 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 built by living things but it's massively modifying the the the, the nature of the earth's surface in a sense it's building mm. something around the coast and changing the flow of the water and, and and all kinds of other stuff um but the other really big thing that was going on is is terrestrialization this was the move of life onto land and 
It had begun much earlier. People know fossil soils, for example, maybe a hundred million years older than the Devonian. And a soil means there's some kind of life on land uh, because obviously plants and animals are needed to make a soil. Um, but it took a long time for life to really get a, a toehold on land. The first things on land were various kinds of very simple plants and, and uh, spider and insect like creatures. And they were there, but the, re the first really good records come from a place called Rhiney in the northeast of Scotland. That's early Devonian. Um, and it, it's the most fantastic locality. It's preserving uh, fine microscopic detail of these small plants and all the little critters that are living within and, and on the plants. So in a way we're getting, it's, it's a near perfect record in fact. It's one of, you know, it's really astonishing when you think how ancient it is. It was discovered in the 1800s, studied in enormous detail about a hundred years ago using uh, microscopy and quite advanced techniques and people are still studying it. Um, and then as we track through the Devonian, um, uh, th this advance of plant life in particular, but also all the little creepy crawlies that go with it and following them very various early little amph uh, amphibians and so on. Um, it, it had a big effect on the earth because I think at the beginning of the Devonian, probably this land life was just like a green fringe around the, the edges of rivers and lakes and maybe around the edge of the sea. By the end of the Devonian, the Earth's surface was largely covered mm -hmm. um, and, and trees had emerged. So it was the evolution of seeds uh, and the evolution of strengthening structures within the plants that allowed them to get bigger than these little, little finger-sized things that came in at the start of the Devonian to a meter high tree, many meters high. Um, and so they were able to feed, they were able to um, extract water from the soil. They didn't have to live with their uh, roots in the water like they did at the beginning of the Devonian. And I think the big thing we see as geologists is that the rate of erosion worldwide reduced by, uh, to about 10%. Wow. So the effect of plants uh, is that they, they fix the surface of the, the, the continents. And, developing soils and stabilizing and, and massively reduce the rate of erosion. So, you know, this was an important time in the history of the earth. So I guess in that sense, then, you know, those reefs that were building offshore of Devon, while there was this continent to the north with mm. plants and forests starting to grow, I mean, that fixing of the, you know, reducing the soil erosion meant that those waters presumably were much more pristine and clear for those coral reefs and to kind of develop. I hadn't thought about that mm. potential interaction. The other I I thing guess. I guess was, critical is the climate changes, the atmospheric changes, the yeah. change in the chemistry of the atmosphere and and uh, and because as we go into that carboniferous you have that lowering of uh, ice age kind of conditions and yeah. huge changes. Just we should say something a little bit about the carboniferous in, the, in this corner, I mean in the southwest we see the carboniferous rocks quite a lot but in the corner of Kevin down in the Torbay area do we see much in terms of the carboniferous with notes there? We don't really. There's a big gap in, in, in the geological record because we do see carboniferous rocks not far away actually in, in Newton Abbott and across into North Devon and Cornwall deposited in, in various sorts of marine environments starting off quite quite deep and then getting shallower and having sort of sands and things spilling off from the land to the north with all the famous coal swamps. But in Torbay they've all been eroded away so we have the deposits of the next geological period, the Permian, sitting directly on top of the Devonian, and the Carboniferous has gone completely removed. And, and I, you know, talking from a, as a, a geologist that likes folds and faults, I mean, we see yeah. it in a different way. We see it as an imprint of folded and, and faulted rock, which will cover in a, a different story. So the, the Carboniferous there is, a, is an imprint rather than anything yeah. uh, tangible. In the sea, uh, and continents collided and pushed all these deposits up to form mountains and we see all the cracks and the folds and the structures are related to forming of these mountains and then these mountains were eroded and we see deposits of the erosion of the mountains. I say this as I usually say more but it still strikes me as almost biblical the way that we just kind of convert you know just say oh that we created this whole mountain range and we stripped it away <laughs> and all yeah. the rest of it. I mean, I think most people, and the time periods that we deal, the currency that we deal with is, is extraordinary for most people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I guess we kind of take it for even ourselves for granted the way that we kind of sweep through history like that. But, um, but for most people coming down to, the, to this area, it's the red rocks that 
spring to mind. That's what they would associate. And I say, when I came down, first of all, I saw the red rocks and I was thinking Devonian because they're the red rocks up here, but they're not, as you alluded to, uh, Kevin, they're, uh, they're Permian. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about those red rocks and, and the changes that's happened to, why are they red? A really obvious kind of question, really. Uh well, they're deposits of a desert, and we know they're deposits of a desert, not just because of the remnants of desert environments you find preserved in them, it's because they're red. The very intense hot conditions of the, do of the deserts sort of affects the iron min minerals in the soils and the deposits, and they turn red. They, they oxidize to a red mineral called hematite, which means like blood. So that's the reason. So when you see a red rock uh, in geology, it's usually telling you something very clear about the environment we call them red beds and it means deserts again so we have geology to... that very clear very simple yeah none of this technical simple, scientific really. stuff <laughs> so we have uh, and we, we actually call the red rocks in devon which are also found across the country to durham and patches in scotland we call them the new red sandstone because they're newer than the old red sandstone so complicated yeah. isn't it Wonderfully <laughs> simple. So th there's other evidence, though, that it's a desert, isn't it? It's not just the fact that it's kind of hematite coated grains. Yeah. We, can, we can see some structures, you can see some imprints again of desert conditions. We can. We, a lot of the deposits around Torn Bay are, are effectively like boulder beds, uh, full of pebbles of the older Devonian limestones, which have been washed down. And the structure in those deposits indicates these were deposited by seasonal flash floods in, in desert bodies because they weren't uh, rivers continuously operating. Sometimes if there was a bit of standing water, we see mud cracks if things dried up in the sun. And we even see sand dunes as well, evidence of actual sand dunes. So we have a lot of evidence in the structures in the rocks of desert environments like wadis and sand dunes and, and drying up pools. So what I find fascinating about geology is that the idea you've got juxtaposition of these gray limestones that were shallow water, tropical limestones, mm and desert that now sit right adjacent to each other, yeah. but it had huge amounts of time. So Mike, tell us, how did we get to this desert from this kind of marine conditions? What was happening to the, us in relation to the planet? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's mainly the, the, it, the, the transition seems more marked because obviously we're missing a big chunk of time, the Carboniferous, but, um, uh, and, and the other thing to note, of course, all that we've been talking about, particularly the Devonian, the um, Permian, uh, being desert and so on, is that we're um, close to the equator at that time. And and um, this is one of the interesting messages that we learn: not only the great spans of time and the big processes of mountain building and stuff, um, but all the evidence from the coral reefs on the one hand in the Devonian and of course the nature of the desert and the direction of wind direction. If you've got dunes you can work out the direction of the wind at the time and all that stuff. Um, shows that the UK was near the equator, in fact south of the equator uh, and, and that's one of the big discoveries of geology in the last 50 years I guess is to be able to reconstruct in a great deal of detail the movement of continents and, and so on. Um, and uh, I guess the, 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 the major change that was happening was that um, sea levels had fallen uh, during this, this transitional time and what had been shallow sea had become land by the time of the um, early Permian. Uh, and um, the, 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 this is all happening in, in, in kind of tropical, tropical uh, latitudes. And, and so what you're also, I mean, I should have mentioned earlier on that Devonian, because in Devonian, it's pretty far south in the equator. Do we know what latitude? I mean, it's the, it's the tropical latitudes of the southern hemisphere, not of the, of the northern hemisphere, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, just thinking about in terms of that, that general picture, because at that time, we've got quite a lot of continental blocks starting to, mm. to migrate together, uh, which is going to produce this, this great continent of Pangaea, which is kind of the centerpiece of, of most geologists around the world kind of interpretation of the kind of landscape. C can we say, someone would like to say something about the, that evolution of, of Pangaea in general? For, that, Kevin, are you well, happy? Yeah, I mean, Pan Pangaea is this famous supercontinent. It's basically a pole to pole continent. Uh, and it's a sort of log jam with all the continents moving around the surface of the earth by continental drift. At this point in time, they all like clogged together to form mm. a supercontinent. Uh, 
later they broke up again to form the world we know today. Um, Devon was a, essentially in the middle of this huge continent in probably one of the hottest deserts. I mean, the, I've seen estimates of 50 degrees centigrade and things oh, wow. like that. Because mm -hmm. of the ex extreme, extreme continental climate formed by this, this, this huge gate structure. So there were deserts all over the place. The world was not a good place. There was sort of mass extinction of life. But the remarkable thing, we do actually get fossils in these desert deposits in Torbay. Uh, there's something if I have, I have one here. Uh -oh. He's got to show us something. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> What is that? This, this, is a, this small one. This this is a burrow of a large millipede. This is probably a juvenile one. The, these things, these burrow structures, got up to about sort of 15 centimeters or more across, and they represent uh, giant, maybe up to a meter long uh, centipede-like animals crawling wow. around in the desert. So, I mean, it's quite remarkable they managed to survive. What we we get the impression actually we seem to have one now recently discovered a spawning ground where lots of little ones were living in an area where there might have been seasonal pools but in the desert fans the bodies going out in into something which was like death valley basically okay so and the bigger ones so they were probably sort of burrowing down and, and sort of resting uh in the heat of the day and coming out uh at night to to scavenge for presumably bits of plant but it's quite remarkable these sorts of things they're called tinidium tinidium wow Tiny. Okay. Yeah. And, and so where might we see that in the english riviera geopark again with the caveat mm. that people can't go school mm. there and knock a little bit off but where, where would you might get a, a glimpse the most famous location is just south of uh goodrington between goodrington and and sultan cove within the local nature reserve there and there's slabs of rock we can see lots of these things so there like, must have been whole colonies colonies of them there's also some more up, up on the north side uh, uh, of, of Torbay in in the sort of uh, Babacombe area as well, where you get some of the baby ones. Okay. So it's various ones of different sizes in different places. Mm. So, so time-wise, what are we talking? Two seventy, two sixty? What oh, about yeah. around about that? The lower part of the poem, so two seventy, two eighty, like that. So because they're actually desert. Uh, they're, sorry, there are actually volcanoes around at the time. Um, with the radiometric elements, we've actually been able to estimate the age of the volcanism, and it puts it around about that sort of age. So are these are these local volcanoes, like it, that would have been in the UK, or this is further afield that would have been just sending their ash dash here? Do well, we know? they are local. They are very local. In this area where I'm in at the moment, near Crediton, there's a whole band of volcanoes going east to west. Uh, but actually in Torbay, we, we don't actually have the remains of the volcanoes, but we have blocks of the lava. So they re we know there was someone around, somewhere around, but we can't, haven't actually found where they are yet, but we have the evidence of them. So if well. someone wanted to see a credit in lava, where would they go to in, uh, in the Riviera to see that? Where are the, some of these blocks? Where's the best place to, to spot the, them? The best places, uh, oh, sort of Holocombe Cliffs, that sort of area. Oh, so that kind of big conglomerate kind of masses, yeah, is that, that the place? Yeah, and also, also just uh, sort of, uh, now what's the, uh, there's a number of sites around that sort of area where you can okay. actually find bits of the lava. So that's sort of about Holocombe to the north, to Paynton, a bit to, a bit to the yeah. north as well. And you can see that you can find the bits of lava because they're sort of bits of rock with holes in, and some of the holes actually represent the air bubbles in the lava and little crystals as well, which formed when the lava was erupted. Oh, very cool. So, so Mike, just take us a bit more general on the Permian, uh, because obviously uh, should, we should say something about where the Permian comes from, the name Perm in, yeah. in, in Russia, isn't it? Yeah, it's a similar story to the, the Devonian. It's named after a location. And in this case, Perm in Russia, which is uh, in the Ural Mountains, and but nonetheless named by a British, or should I stress, a Scottish geologist. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so in Britain, we, for some mysterious reason, we named most of the geological periods and, and often people in other countries are a bit miffed by that fact. But the Russians are very proud of the Permian and there are great monuments in Perm to show it. But it was indeed a Roderick Murchison who named it in 1841. And it was because this was the last piece of the jigsaw. He was a great proponent of the formal naming of um, a stratigraphic column. 
Uh, and people in other countries, particularly the French and the Germans, they said, this is ridiculous. You know, you're setting up these, these um, named units like the Devonian, the Carboniferous, the Permian, and you're describing them, but they just apply to Britain. Why would they apply in other parts of the world? And famously, Murchison set off across Europe. He went through Poland, went to Russia, met the uh, Russian emperor and, and enjoyed the, all of that stuff and then went charging all over Russia in a stagecoach. Um, and he discovered the same fossils that he'd seen in the UK, including he was able to prove absolutely that the Devonian uh, in closely connected locations in Russia contained both the old red type fish and the marine fossils. So he was able to clinch that in 1839. Um, but there was this new red sandstone, which was the big mystery that, that Kev mm -hmm. had mentioned. People had named the Carboniferous because it carries coal, mm -hmm. Carbonifer. They'd named the Triassic because it's made of three parts in Germany. And in between and kind of overlapping into the Triassic is this mystery new red sandstone that was known in Devon, which Kev has been describing. And it's known from many other parts of Europe. Um, but it wasn't, didn't have a formal name. And, and I guess and so that was, was that because of the lack of fossils? I mean, this is a desert sandstone yeah, with, you know, burrows yeah. very... Did, yeah, that's yeah. absolutely right, because I think they understood, as we do now, that you have to have some fossils to, that you can find in different locations, and they act as a kind of marker. Uh, and the kinds of burrows that, that, that Kevin described, of course, they're, they're no use at all, because they can be any old age you like. Uh, but in Russia, he found near Perm, he found um, uh, mollusks and other age type fossils that he believed were marking the base of the, the new red sandstone. So he named the Permian and that was the last part of the sequence. All the other bits pretty much had been named. People have subsequently subdivided here and there, but um, hmm. there we are. No, it's, uh, and it's, I mean, uh, this, this, the English Riviera is probably one of the best places to see yeah. these yeah. these ex coastal exposures of the these these Permian rocks. I mean, yeah. Kevin, what's in terms of you, your favourite places, favourite little nooks and crannies to see the those kind of Permian rocks? Where would you go if you could have the chance? Uh, south of uh, around about Salton Cove, between Salton Cove and Goodrington, is a really mm. good place. It's all rough and. So sometimes slippery on the beach, so you need a falling tide. But you can see all these these boulder heads full of rocks and washed down in in the flash floods. You can see the burrows of these giant millipede things scurrying around, and you can see some of the associated sand deposits again. So that that area is pretty good and, and relatively easy uh, accessible. But as I say, you do need a, a falling tide. So, but anywhere where you have red rocks around Torbay, I mean, some people even have in, in them in their back gardens. It's mm -hmm. always worth having a look and maybe getting a, a hand lens out a magnifying glass and looking at the little red coated grains which sort of indicate it was formed in the desert the walls are built yeah. of it as well as well as the limestones and you so say you can see the corals in in the walls around Torbay not just in the rocks themselves you can just walk down the street and see corals yeah that's a good point isn't it I mean that that's something again we'd be probably you know if you're a geologist, you know these things, but everyone else kind of takes them for granted. It's, it literally is part of the fabric of the urban fabric mm. of the Southwest, both the Devonian limestones and also those, those Permian red rocks. Um, in terms of kind of what happens next, I mean, this, the, uh, the, the, the Permian is a really interesting time because it's, it's this big desert across this vast area, etc. And yet when we get to about kind of 250 million years something extraordinary happens, isn't it? I mean, Mike, tell us about what happens at 251, is that right? 251 million two years ago two, on a Tuesday. Yeah, I'll, I'll just lead up to it, connecting it back to the, the, the localities that Kevin yes. was talking about. Um, although the, the, the Permian was, a, was a, full of deserts, uh, we do in many localities have footprints of um, tetrapods. And unfortunately, this is something people have looked for very actively all over Devon in the hope of finding mm -hmm. some five or four toed footprint, but uh, they're, 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 they're very hard to find. Um, but we do know from other localities in the UK, uh, both um, footprints and skeletons, and they give the story of what was happening. And so um, after life, had, uh, vertebrates had come onto land, we had various amphibians that could live in the water and in the rather damp 
uh, Carboniferous forests forming coal. When the Devonian, when the um, Permian came along, of course, in the deserts, those amphibians couldn't survive, and it was typically animals we call reptiles now. They're they're um, adapted to living in dry conditions. They lay eggs they, uh, on land. They don't need to lay them in the water. So during the Permian, there's a huge array of these creatures, and by the end of the Permian, we certainly know from Russia and, and South Africa. Some of them got quite big and the ecosystems got very complicated uh, and there were there were even giant uh, plant eaters that were about the size of hippopotamuses and there were predators specially evolved to feed on them, saber-toothed reptiles with long teeth who were mm. leap on their back and, and probably the hippo-like reptiles wouldn't even notice because they had very tiny brains and they would just carry on and so on. I remember something that the Kuratarsons, that's the one I remember as well. <laughs> I'm not sure they've ever been found necessarily in the in the English Riviera, but uh, yeah. Quite. And, um, and then all of that finished. As you say, there was a huge extinction. This was the biggest mass extinction of the, uh, that we know of the, 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 the whole of the, the, the last 500 million years. Uh, it happened at the end of the Permian, uh, and when I began to be interested in that, the, the whole story was very unsure, but it's really sharpened up a lot in the last 10 or 15 years with uh, remarkable new work, particularly in China, but also in Russia. And this has been uh, an exciting time for geologists because it's sort of a kind of international thing that wasn't possible before, and it now is. And the dating has improved, and it even shows that there were maybe within a short span of time, maybe two or three separate uh, uh, events all contributing together. And the quality of the radiometric dating now allows us to discriminate uh, these events with maybe only 60,000 years between them. And the story is, this has all come together and is pretty well accepted now, is that this massive extinction event, which we know caused the loss of more than 90% of species, um, was caused by massive volcanic, volcanic eruptions in Russia. They're called the Siberian Traps and they cover a gigantic area and they're basalt, black uh, volcanic uh, rock, a bit like what is being produced by the um, volcanic fissures in Iceland. So these, we don't think about pointy volcanoes like Etna and Vesuvius sending explosions of uh, gas and, and rocks and, and lava, but more long fissures where the lava pours out, but not explosively. But they produce a huge amount of gas, just as much gas as the, the, the Plinian type pointed volcanoes. And it's the gas that's the key thing. I mean, clearly any giant reptile wandering about in the region of the eruptions would get overwhelmed by the lava. But this went worldwide because the, the gas, particularly um, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, um, uh, sulfur uh, compounds, uh, on the one hand mixed with water to form acid, like sulfuric acid, acid rain, and um, uh, that acid also affected the oceans and they became acidified. But the second effect was uh, global warming. And, and the effect of that production of those gases, these are all greenhouse gases, as, as they're called, water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide. And I think the measurements show, the measurements from the rocks show that there were sharp warming spikes of more than 10 degrees, which mm. at first people think, oh, that's no big deal. You know, this was raising the temperature of the oceans from maybe 25 or 30 up to about 40. And 40 is the temperature of a hot shower. And people might think, that's quite nice, you know, that'd be okay, quite like that. But actually today, no, nobody wants to live in those conditions. So any time that the oceans in the tropics get warmed to 40 degrees, um, all the fish and other creatures move away. They just can't survive at that temperature. And so that's what would have happened then, the, the warming, the acidification. And on land, the, the, the acid rain killed the plants and all the soil washed away. So all of that protection that the plants mm -hmm. had given to the continents back in the Devonian at a stroke was removed and, and there was a huge pulse of erosion, massive wash off of all the soil on earth washed into the ocean pretty much overnight, coupled with the warming and, and this sort of synergy of the multiple processes, I think where people have done experiments on modern, looking at modern 
ocean life. Uh, where you combine acidification with sharp warming, that has a kind of, you know, they can maybe survive one thing yeah. a wee bit or the other thing a wee bit. Put them together. My yeah. God, you yeah. know, that just kills them. So people think when you mention that this was the biggest mass extinction of all time, you think, oh, we must have been bombarded by meteorites yeah. and all kinds of terrible, mm. terrible things. No, not a bit of it. It's an actual earthbound process, simple as a volcano erupting, but a bloody big volcano. Yeah, yeah. And we can model all of that. And I guess my final thing is that um, this is actually really, really important for earth sciences, geology, because it gives us uh, one example of many where we can actually prove the quality of our tools to disentangle the processes. And this is a kind of combination of paleontology, chemistry, uh, and, and modeling, and mathematics, and physics. And, and this allows us actually to feed in information into models for um, future climate on Earth. Well, I was going to say, and also, I guess, a general point that lots of people, and actually a lot of people who are geologists, will say, oh, the climate's always changed, and, and actually we, we know it goes up and down. And Well, here's an instance where there really was extreme global warming, and it wasn't good. I mean, one of the things you geology teaches you, you get from global warming is extinction of species. So, yeah. so again, that's a really powerful one. But in terms of, Kevin, in terms of, do we see any of that in the, um, you know, people can't go to the English Riviera and see the, the end Permian extinction event. Uh, how, how does it play out really locally? Well, we, we see the extreme conditions in, in, in the desert. And as I say, we have some evidence of volcanism, but unrelated obviously to what was going on in Siberia. Uh, the problem is because we were in the desert and the latitudes of the deserts from, from the Permian period to the next Triassic, we don't actually see much of what was going on at the time. Yeah. If you're in another area, China or Southern Europe, where you have a transition from Permian to Triassic, you see these things just go out. What we see is the extreme conditions. Our lovely Tynidium fossils made by these giant millipedes do disappear though. So they're, okay. they, that group of animals was one of the sort of the, the victims of this extinction event. They hung so on. So even so burrowing organisms couldn't survive <laughs> that. Yeah, they were living on land, and and they were, the environment was so extreme that they they just couldn't survive any longer. They hung on for a while, and then they disappear. So they're part of that global picture, and. Uh, yeah, I and mean, we, we do have some evidence of the plants in this environment as well, from various spores and things which have been found in these sediments. But again, we, we don't have the nice marine situations where we can actually see the problems with the ocean chemistry and other things happening. So but, yeah, you, I mean, if it, so you have to go somewhere else, unfortunately, to see that story. Yeah, well, maybe that's not so bad, you know, it leaves it for other places. But I think what's, what, what I think is fascinating really is you know, you imagine that train journey and you come in and you, you know, I always think of this area as red rocks and grey rocks. I, that's a really kind of simple way to, to look at it. But the, the thing I, I always think is it, it's the stories those red rocks and grey rocks tell. It's the most amazing mm. thing, isn't it? And to think that you can be sitting there on one of the beaches in Torbay and have those red rocks behind you. And, and the story they tell about the most I think argue the most extraordinary moment in Earth's history. I mean, would you that, say that, Mike? Would you have it down as that? In terms of what's well documented, I guess so. I mean, there probably were more. There must have been much more extreme times in the Precambrian, the, mm -hmm. the early uh, part of the history of the Earth. But I think, in terms of um, the rather better known uh, rock record, where we can. Um, work it out in detail. I don't think anybody has, you know, there is nothing else like it. People talk about, or when with people hear the term mass extinction, they think, oh, dinosaurs. And they think sure. the other event, that was the other big extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago. But actually it, it was just, it was nothing. It was just a walk in the park compared to the end Permian. And maybe the dinosaurs went, but um, in terms of the effect on the history of the earth and the history of life, it was, it was not really much. Life recovered fairly quickly and it was pretty much similar after the event than it was before, except the dinosaurs had gone. But um, whereas I think the evidence that what happened 250 million years ago really does punctuate the history of, the history of life, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. And nothing was the same again, you know, because yeah. so much had been wiped out, both in the oceans and on land that 
life really started again and the modern kinds of organisms that we're used to today, they pretty much all track back uh, uh, into the time of recovery just, just after that crisis. So that's a nice, well, Kevin, you were gonna say something, sorry. Oh. Yeah, it's worth saying that we do actually have a record of another mass extinction in, in, in the global geopark, not on the scale of the Permian, but the, the, the late Devonian uh, was also a time of mass extinction, but a different sort of mass extinction. In the middle part of the Devonian, 380 million years ago, we had these very rich uh, reef communities, just like reefs are today, very, very diverse. But deepening water uh, and an incoming of mud meant these reefs sunk into deep water and were exterminated. So we do actually see going into the upper Devonian by about 350 million years ago, we do actually see uh, a mass extinction event and we can actually plot it in Torbay by the, just the disappearance of the reefs and the associated uh, animals uh, and just gradually declines in diversity and diversity mm. towards the Devonian. So we do have a record of that one. It's more subtle, it's not as dramatic, yep. Yep. but we do have that extinction preserved in Torbay. I think most people would find it absolutely extraordinary that those those rocks that are so familiar and so apparently mm. you know boring preserve this remarkable record of these extraordinary changes. You know, just looking at the red rocks of themselves. You know, a mm. time when all of the world's land masses were together, a glo a, a regional continental scale desert at which we were the part, the heart, you know, the heart, and then this this global extinction event that rewrites the you know, the life and. The, that's extraordinary. And that's, I guess, what the joy of, of geology is that you have this curse. Maybe it's a curse. Maybe it's a, you've been able to read these rocks and pull out these stories. So I'm eternally grateful to, to both of you, Mike Benton and Kevin Page, for helping us guide us through that. Thank you very much.